camera, please feel free to, for, to turn off your camera. All right. All right, so we can just dive right into it um, to not take too much of everyone's time. Um, so first of all, good afternoon, everyone. If you're in Vancouver, actually, um, welcome to our workshop on From Prescription Opioids to Fentanyl, A Patient's Journey, Our Patient Voice. Um, so firstly, I want to introduce myself. So I'm Tam, and I'm a research member at the Vancouver General Hospital, as well as uh, at uh, the research lab at UBC Department of Psychiatry. And uh, I'll be the moderator for today's session. And of course, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Puya Azar, the head of the Complex Pain Addiction Service, or CPAS, at the Vancouver uh, General Hospital. Um, so Dr. Dr. Azar's expertise spans managing pain, mental health disorders, and substance use disorders across Vancouver General Hospital, as well as the University of British Columbia um, Hospital and GF Strong Rehabilitation Center. He also serves as the addiction lead at Foundry Vancouver Granville and a consulting physician for adolescence addiction medicine at BC Children Hospital. And additionally, he's also involved in clinical research focusing on opioid agonist treatment protocols and medical devices to enhance health outcomes for patients with mental health and substance use disorders. And um, as one of Dr. Azar's colleagues, I know that he highly values the, the, the voices of uh, his uh, clients. Uh, hence today's workshop will be in the format of an interview. So we'll be hearing um, the perspective of one of Dr. Azar's clients, um, Ross, um, glad to have you here. Um, so please help me welcome uh, both of them, Ross Rissell and Dr. Puya Azar. So whenever you're ready, um, I'll pass it Thank on you. to you. And um, hopefully one, one of my colleagues, um, Jess Machado, will be able to join us to help with the interview. She's actually currently presenting um, uh, a talk, um, which will be ending soon. So thank you so much for having me. Um, it, it's a real honor and pleasure to be able to um, share uh, today with everybody. I think there's eight, over 80 people in the audience. So um, yeah, really an honor. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, as much academic work as I do in terms of like pharmacology and medical devices and different areas of research, I think one of the most important things I can do is um, also present the perspective of our, our people with lived experience. Um, we sometimes run the risk of um, minimizing addiction or opioid use disorder to an opioid defici deficiency syndrome, in a sense, um, talking about solutions in the form of um, pharmacology and uh, medical um, algorithms and protocols, etc. But I think we run the risk of um, not fully understanding the process of addiction if we do that, and therefore not serving our clients to the best of our ability. So for that reason, I'm super excited that Ross was able to join me today. And really the goal of today's session is going to be walking you through Ross's journey from uh, the kid next door um, to his struggles with addiction, ending up in Vancouver's downtown east side and now back home. Um, it's, it's a complex process and you know I feel like oftentimes when we may drive through the downtown side and people and see people struggling um, we may not fully appreciate the process that may have been involved for them to end up where they are um, and potential paths out of their current circumstance um, so um, having said that I think we'll jump right in um, and, and um, Ross Maybe if you want to unmute yourself, we can sort of just jump into the, the interview. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Um, I guess a, a couple of other things before we, we jump in. Um, you know, the views that I'm going to express today, um, you know, they're, they're, they're my own. I'm not speaking on behalf of any health authority or, or our hospital. I'm certainly not speaking on behalf of Vancouver Coastal Health or Vancouver General Hospital. Um, and um, I really, really appreciate, I'm, I'm grateful, Ross, that you could join us today. I appreciate, we may talk about some difficult life experiences that you've gone through, and I can appreciate it could be vulnerable, you can feel vulnerable talking about these experiences, and it can be difficult, particularly in front of an audience. So I know it's a huge ask, um, but, uh, and I appreciate you coming out today. Yeah, no um, worries. Cool. 
Um, so uh, there's just a message in, in the chat. Somebody is also th thanking you, um, and they're looking forward to learning from you. So Ross, let's um, let's start a little bit backwards. Instead of going chronologically in terms of your childhood, let's jump to life in Vancouver's downtown east side. Sure. Um, um, I understand you were essentially homeless in the downtown east side for what period of time? A couple of years. A couple of years. Um, on and off, yeah. On and off. And can you walk me through what a day may be may have been like for you living downtown inside? Um, yeah, I mean it's just not easy to being down there, obviously. Um, just like trying mm -hmm. to make money every day to get drugs every day. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean it's not as bad as people might think it is, I guess. But um, I mean it's uh it's not a fun life, but uh, it's a struggle every day, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. And then let's 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 sort of understand that step by step. Okay, at nighttime, right? where are you sleeping? So usually there is like shelter space or someone's house that I can stay at, right? So being homeless, really, uh, when I say it, I only think of like not having your own place to stay, right? So most people still have somewhere to go inside, right? But the winter time is a lot worse down there, right? Obviously, because it's cold every day, right? So right, yeah. So at nighttime, try and stay in a shelter, or whatever. And some of the shelters you can stay at consistently. So once you go there, if you come back the next night, then you have a consistent place to stay, right? But gotcha. a lot of those places they're just enabling people to live the way they're living anyways, right? So the lower the barrier to the shelter is the lower barrier shelters is where people are usually going to want to stay, right? Because they're not going to kick you out for using or whatever, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's kind okay. of a catch-22. They're trying to help people, but they're kind of enabling them in a way. But Yeah, okay. Um, so if you can get a shelter bed, you'll stay in a shelter. Yeah. If you can't, if you can't where would you be sleeping? Uh, you probably wouldn't be sleeping. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, you wouldn't you're be sleeping. Gonna, you're not going to be feeling safe or anything, anymore, right? So... If you're truly homeless, you're not going to be sleeping anywhere because you're not going to feel safe. Yeah. So, so yeah. what what would you do then? Just wander around all night, stay awake. Yeah. Safety reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then sunrise, what do you do? Uh, in the morning time, most people just uh, trade whatever medication they have for drugs or whatever, or get some drugs in the morning and then go out and do whatever nefarious activities throughout the day to make more money to get more drugs. Sounds like life. For you anyways and uh, may have revolved around using so doing whatever yeah. you need to do yeah absolutely yeah yeah and then um sort of that cycle will continue i suppose yeah okay we'll delve into more detail around your experience living under those circumstances yeah. um yeah. when you painted a picture of what that may have looked like for you now let's backtrack um let's try to get a sense of okay Let's go way back in time. You're a kid in school. Uh, I'm assuming like any other kid who, who's in elementary or junior high. What was school like, like for you? Uh, school was, was hard because um, uh, I, was, was, I was smart, so it was hard to pay attention to school because I found that I could finish the schoolwork so quickly that I just wouldn't be occupied by anything else, right? So I was always um, speaking out in class or making jokes or being the clown, class clown trying, trying to get attention from other people, right? So I never really fit in in school, and then I um, I got alienated by the whole school system, I guess, at a young age. So yeah. my my trouble started when I was about ten years old. Was when I started getting in trouble at school, right? So about ten years old, I started getting in trouble, and then um, it got worse throughout the years. And then eventually, I just wound up spending most of my time in the hallway or suspended, right? So yeah, that's interesting because it's not that you found schoolwork particularly difficult, but Rather, it seems like it was easy to easy for you. In fact, it was so easy that you had a lot of extra time on your, on your hands. You would get bored and act out and get into trouble. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, OK, so a few years goes by and now you, you feel like you're, you're labeled as like the bad kid or the class clown. Is that yeah, but like when I was 10, I started smoking weed and doing drugs and stuff like that. So yeah. by the time I was about 12 or 13, I was like uh, uh, pretty much labeled as the class clown or whatever. And I was always get in trouble. Right. So. But uh, yeah, it was it was about twelve or thirteen that got worse. And that's interesting for me. Um, at ten, smoking weed. Uh, how does that happen? How how were you introduced to cannabis, and and how is it that for a ten year old was you were able to smoke weed? Yeah, so I well, I moved to Abbotsford when I was ten years old, and then yeah. uh, first first year of school there was grade six. So when I went to school in grade six, um, everyone was smoking weed and everything like that, right? So and then I also started doing ecstasy at that age too, right? So just because it was around. Where I moved, everyone had it, right? So it was a common thing. 
Okay. And where I where I went to school was a high school next to a middle school. So where we would hang out in the back forest or whatever was where the high school kids would go to, right? So it was the it was all the high school kids and all the middle school kids would still okay. be in the same area. Mm -hmm. And and help me understand because okay, so it sounds like it was available in your school. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty prevalent, but I'm guessing not everybody was smoking weed. What was it about your friend group or what was it about your circumstance that led you to to smoke um, cannabis? So part of it was the fact that I was getting in trouble in school and, and acting out. So then those other people that were acting out were the ones who were smoking weed. So then being on that outcast kind of group of friends or whatever, that was what it was. So the other people gotcha. were getting in trouble. They, a lot of them were getting in trouble because they were having difficulty in school and they just weren't smart enough to do it. But because I was having difficulty in a different way, it was the same thing, right? So hmm. That's interesting. So it sounds like a group of kids get into trouble for various reasons but are sort of grouped together. And these kids may, some of them may have been the more sort of impulsive or um, kids who may have been acting out because of other reasons, whatever re those reasons may have been, may have led them to use drugs at an early age. And now you find yourself within this peer group. Yeah. And you say, this is the group that you're now accepted into. Yeah. Whereas other groups you're not. So this is, yeah, good morning. Great. Okay, great. Sorry, guys. Um, my co-host is here, so this is gonna. Um, okay, great. And, and Ross, you've met Jessica before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, just for the audience, this is Jessica Shadow. She's uh, an addiction nurse who works on our service um, and beyond uh, being a nurse on our service. Really, in many ways, runs the show for us. So, really grateful to have her on our team and grateful to have her here. Um, she's interviewed you in the past, actually, Ross. So yeah, should be familiar. We're just getting to the fact that Ross is now grouped within a group of children at school who are using cannabis, and he feels accepted within this group, whereas and feels maybe rejected by other kids in the school. Is that right, Ross? Yep, yeah. and at a very young age too. Like once the teachers, the teachers were the ones who were responsible for policing us in a way too, right? So they knew if we smoked weed at lunchtime that we wouldn't annoy them. So but just due to the fact we weren't annoying the rest of the class, they would kind of let us slide for that. You know what I mean? So they, they weren't they weren't interested in giving us a hard time or giving us trouble for it because they knew that we were going to be there anyway. So they would rather have us not annoying everyone else. When we smoked weed, we would be quiet and wouldn't annoy everyone else. So we kind of got a free pass on that one. We very young age, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so and you know from a sort of psychiatry lens, I guess it's um. Uh, there's an attachment component as well because you know, as, as human beings, we relationships are important for us. Um, we call them attachments, um, and they can be the most important aspect of a person's life, particularly a young person, to feel included, to feel accepted, and to have friends. So it sounds like if you're in a particular group and these are now your attachment figures in school, that child may do whatever it takes to be. To remain connected with this group, even if it means doing drugs with them, where internally it may not feel right. Does yeah, that, yeah, that makes does sense. That yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so that attachment aspect is already coming into play at a young age. You're starting to use drugs. So you started off with which ones? Uh, marijuana and ecstasy. When I was ten. Marijuana and ecstasy. Okay, and then so great. So age 10, 11, 12. Now, what happened in your early teenage years? Uh, that was when uh, the Oxycontin uh, became an issue or whatever. That was when I was like 14, maybe. That would have been like 2008, I think. And that was when the Oxycontin was a big problem or whatever. It was going to be overprescribed for those pills. So that was the transition to opiates or whatever. Because we didn't really, like we had a negative view of heroin, for example, when we were younger because of like Hollywood movies and stuff and like what our idea in our head was of heroin. We would have we never done heroin, but we'd seen the pill or whatever. So we, we thought oh, it was just a pill. It can't be bad for you, right? So that was how I started doing Oxycontin. I mean, that's actually an interesting point that you raise is um, your view of, okay, so like your view of cannabis may have been that maybe, you know, it's it's not as harmful and, and it was more acceptable to use. Um, it sounds like your view of oxycodone may have been similar, but your view of heroin at that point, you were seeing from like Hollywood movies, it was like a hard drug. So as a 13-year-old, you weren't considering using heroin, but what was yeah. it about Yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
Well, we just because it was a pill, right? So we thought, oh, if a doctor gives it to people, then it couldn't be that bad, right? Because it's just a pill. Gotcha. So, so in some ways, oxygen. We, we weren't even we weren't even snorting at the beginning. We were just swallowing it, swallowing the pill, right? So it was just like, oh, you're just swallowing like half a pill or whatever. It's not a big deal. It's like a Tylenol, right? Got you. And and okay, so it didn't seem dangerous. It was a prescription medication. So and but how are you accessing it? Like, how does a 13 year old get oxycodone? Uh, just friends that I knew that had it. Just yeah. growing up in the high in the high school. Like, is it high yeah. school at this point? Yeah. Yeah, it was beginning of high school. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, so oxycodone starting to show up. Uh, what was it about oxycodone that you enjoyed? Uh, I just didn't have a hangover, right? Because like before that, when I did ecstasy, I would feel like shit for like three days after. So when I did oxycodone, I didn't feel like a hangover or anything, and there was no like, it didn't seem like there was any downside to doing it, right? And I wasn't addicted to it yet, so I didn't really know what addiction was. There's no downside. What well, what were the upsides? Just uh, obviously the feeling of it, right? So it's a pretty powerful drug, right? So it makes you feel pretty good. Um. I think that ties into does that tie into like your attachment style like that group that you were hanging out you had like a yeah there was there was four or five people uh, there was four or five people I'd hang out with every day right and we all did things together right so that was part of it too right so um what about cool okay all right so now you're using oxycodone and you're using it within this attachment group so like the stakes are going are getting a little bit higher because for, for people in the audience, if they may not know, oxycodone is um, rel relatively powerful synthetic opioid. It's sort of about one and a half times more powerful than morphine. Um, not as powerful as, uh, as hydromorphone and certainly nowhere near as powerful as um, fentanyl. Okay. Um, so you're using, did, did it ever become a daily use? Oh yeah, I did. At the end of it, yeah, it definitely did become a daily use because once we started doing it a lot, then we started feeling shitty when we weren't doing it, right? But we still didn't understand that we were addicted to it yet. Though. We had no idea what that was, right? Like the first time yeah. that me and my friends couldn't get oxycodone, we got withdrawal. We didn't even know what it was. We thought we all got the flu or something. That's so interesting. Okay, so you didn't know you were quote unquote addicted to it. Yeah. Um, you started using it every day, and then when you couldn't access it, you you felt sick and you thought you had the flu, you and your friends. Yeah, I mean, all my friends all thought we had the flu. We didn't even know what addiction was because there was no education in school about that, or we didn't really have an understanding of it, right? Um, yeah. So how did you transition to heroin at this point? That was when uh, we couldn't get oxys from the dealer anymore, and then the dealer offered, offered us heroin instead. And we we're like, well, we'd never do heroin. He's like, you've been doing heroin the whole time. It's just in a pill. Like, and that's why we started doing heroin, because we all got sick, and we didn't want to feel that way anymore, right? So then that was when they were like, oh, you've been doing heroin the whole time. It's just in a pill. So we bought heroin instead to stop feeling sick. Got you. Got you. Interesting. What would have happened if the if before you started using oxycodone, the dealer had offered you heroin straight up? No, I probably wouldn't have done it in that situation, right? Because I was pretty young at the time. I probably still had a negative view of it, right? But once I was once I was addicted to it and I didn't know what I was doing, then it was a different story, right? Right. So at this point, you're not doing heroin because you want to do heroin. You're doing heroin because you want to stop the withdrawal symptoms. Yeah, exactly. And that was the first time I ever experienced withdrawal. So. Got it. Um, if I had known it would only last like a day or two or whatever, maybe I would have just wrote it out and dealt with the withdrawals for two days and I would have been finding it, right? But I didn't under my mind at that time, I didn't really understand that withdrawals would go away that quickly, right? So I didn't understand that. So we're this, at this, this, point is, this, this is long before Suboxone and Methadone and thing, methadone things like that were around, right? So we didn't even know there was an alternative to doing heroin, right? If we had known that you could just get a methadone prescription or something else, some other kind of alternative, we probably would have done that too, right? But this was long before that ever happened. So at this point, are you using the heroin at, at like daily? Like how, how's your use looking and how old are you? Uh, I think it was like 14 at that point. And it was, uh, I don't know if it was every day all the time or whatever, but it was a little bit though. It wasn't much. Yeah. Um, can I ask, like, okay, so you're using oxys. You're on a daily basis, you're getting withdrawal symptoms. Was there ever the possibility of reaching out for help, for help, like teachers or counselors or parents? Was Maybe that not in my mind at that time, though. Probably 
my mind, I didn't feel like there were. Oh, it just started talking now. Okay, in my mind, I didn't feel like there was the ability to get help at that time. There probably there probably was the ability to, but I didn't feel like there was. I'm curious at this point. You know, you're 14. You're using heroin. Is anyone recognizing this? Is anyone reaching out to you? And you know, you talked Definitely. about this isolating experience. Yeah, there was no one that was. Uh, there was no one that was obviously knew knew what we were doing. Right, we were pretty much flying under the radar at that point. Okay, so, okay, the stakes are getting higher and higher. Now you're using heroin. You started with cannabis, now went to oxycodone, now heroin. Um, what came next? I wanted to go into an alternative school where all the other kids that got kicked out of their schools from my school district went, right? So that would expose me to a lot more, like uh, a group of friends or whatever that I'd hang out with that were the bad crowd, I guess you could say, right? So there's a lot more drug use prevalent in school, right? So then that got kind of kickstarted things into like, high gear, whatever. That was about 14 years old. So I went to an alternative school and that was that made things worse. Okay. So now you're learning new things. Yeah. And what did you get exposed to? Uh, just like, uh, it wasn't like a bad group of kids in my school. It was just every kid was a bad kid, right? So it was like everyone that I went to school with was either expelled or kicked out of their school in my school district for whatever they're doing. So most of them had drug problems where I went to school. Pretty much everyone did. So that was just meant I was hanging around with everyone that was doing drugs instead of just some people. Was it okay? So you went to this alternative school. At this point, was it recognized by it, the school or your parents that you quote unquote had a drug problem or or was it just um, I would say problem? probably no, more of a behavior problem. Pretty much pretty much like was recognized as like a behavior issue, not a drug drug issue. Okay. Okay, so there were there was behavior, and for whatever reason, um, people were not able to determine that some of the driving factors behind the behavior was related to substance use. Yeah, exactly. And so there was no offer of treatment for the substance use. It was just like, okay, let's package the, these kids all together. Yeah, exactly. And so you went from heroin to what else at this point? I was doing cocaine at that point too, I think, with heroin. What was that like? Uh, it just made it, my drug problem worse, however, right? Because then it was like ups and downs, highs and lows and stuff, so made it worse. Got it. Um, and then what happened? Um, pretty much finished at uh, the alternative school or whatever, and then I went to trade school at that point. Um, finishing mm -hmm. high school or whatever, and then um, my drug problem got worse. I could go to trade school. I was about 18 years old at that point, I think. Yeah. That was when I started partying every day, like drinking alcohol all the time and uh, using drugs all the time. So I'm curious, with you going to trade school, how did that look? Did I went to school. I went to like a trade school program that was uh, my last year of high school. Um, I went to um, like a, a, a program for operating equipment. And then when I finished school, I went to UFB in Chilliwack where it was like a, it was a commercial transport mechanic. Um, uh, before you go to get your apprenticeship, before you start working, you go to like an eight month program at UFB. So I had my own place to live at that point and I had more freedom at that point. I had a car, right? So I started partying every day and then that kind of affected my schooling, obviously, and my grades. And then I wanted not going to sh not showing up to school and I got kicked out of school because of that, right? So that was, that was the first time I was like really using every day and partying every day was about 18 years old when I went to that program. And I got, got I got kicked out of it eventually towards the end of the year, right? So, because I wasn't showing up, so. Yeah, I think that's like really important to draw attention to because you were able to, you know, get a license, drive, go to school, manage, it sounds like, all of these other interactions and still be using substances, right? Yeah. And I think, I, I'm like, my next question is, what was home like for you? I hear you moved out and maybe away at 18. Oh, so like I, I don't know, like my home was always good. Like I didn't have like a bad abusive childhood or anything like that, right? But I had like a lot of freedom, right? So, um, yeah, so I had a lot of freedom and I wasn't really like under mom's thumb all the time, right? So, um, I guess in a way that was good because my mom was just trying to be a good parent or whatever, right? But she kind of gave me a lot of freedom to do whatever I wanted, right? So from a young age, like I never, no one ever really like, knew what I was doing, right? So I could do what I wanted and no one like caught me for it, right? If that makes sense. Okay. Um, all right, 18 years old, get, you're, you're now kicked out of your program from school. Um, where do you go next? 
Um, I went downhill for a little while. Um, actually, you know what? Yeah, it was pretty much downhill from there. And then I started, um, I didn't have a job, so I started selling drugs to make money. And um, pretty much just did that for a couple of years. And that was when I got like uh, really into smoking. Uh, I switched from cocaine to smoking crack. I was still smoking heroin. I never used needles in my whole life, but I was still smoking heroin. But I started doing it every day. And I started smoking crack at that point. And I was just selling drugs to make money. So I was just pretty much my day every day. Wake up feeling like shit and then just try and get really high in the morning to feel better because I was hungover from the night before and then go make money all day. But it was just enough to support myself, though. It wasn't like I was actually keeping any of it. <laughs> okay. So again, thing, things are escalating powder cocaine to crack cocaine, which is much more addictive. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, and do you remember the transition from heroin to fentanyl? Uh, so the transition for heroin for fentanyl, so like it was just the availability thing, right? So like I always said, when I quit doing Oxycontin, it wasn't because I quit doing it, it wasn't available anymore. 2008, 2009 was when I started getting addicted to Oxycontin because it was available. So because everyone had prescriptions for it, that was when I was able to get it. And then when the heroin came into play, it was when the Oxycontin wasn't available anymore, right? The prices of it went up really high and then there wasn't around anymore because all the doctors stopped over prescribing it. So then when I switched from heroin to fentanyl, it was kind of the same thing. There just wasn't heroin around anymore. There was just, that was when fentanyl started coming around. And then at first we didn't really know what it was because it was mixed. It might've been mixed in, right? So maybe it might've been like some fentanyl mixed with mostly heroin, right? So we didn't really know we were doing it at that point in time. And then that was when it was just starting to come around in British Columbia. And then, um, and then eventually it was just fentanyl, but it took a long time for that transition to happen. Right? For a while there, it was just mostly heroin with some fentanyl laced in it just to make it cheaper for people to make it, right? And then eventually we were doing fentanyl and we didn't really know if that makes sense. Because heroin has like, um, heroin makes you feel positive, like a, like a good feeling. There's like a positive feeling attached to it. Fentanyl doesn't make you feel anything at all. It just kills your pain. So, and, and heroin lasts like eight or 10 or 12 hours in your system. You don't have to smoke it all day long. But fentanyl, it just wears off in like 30 minutes or an hour. So that was the difference, right? That was when we started figuring out we were doing fentanyl. That's when we started figuring out, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we saw that clinically, you know, with our patients where just like you described, it was like heroin, then laced heroin with fentanyl. They didn't really know it was laced to can't get heroin anymore. And it's only fentanyl. And now I have a whole cohort of patients who've never used heroin ever before. It's, it's all they know is fentanyl. Yeah. Um, Okay, and then how did that impact you now that you're using fentanyl? No, uh, it just made it more difficult, I guess, or whatever, to live my life. Or, uh, because it's a lot harder to function when you're doing fentanyl because it's so strong, right? So it kind of just zoinks you out, right? So it's not like you can, like, be, you can't really be a functioning addict on fentanyl because you look like a zombie, right? So it's pretty much a lot more, affects you a lot more physically, right? So it sounds like you're describing it's almost like a need. It wasn't like I want to do this. It was you were experiencing perhaps like withdrawal. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, most of the time when I was using it at that point, it was just because I had to use it, so I wasn't withdrawing. It wasn't like I was choosing to use it. Yeah, and I, and at that point too, I had never gone through withdrawal, so I didn't know that it only lasts for a few days, right? So I didn't know that I could actually quit. If that makes sense. I wasn't aware that you could just quit and then you'd feel better in a week. And what is that? I, I mean, I don't know if everyone knows, and maybe you would feel comfortable sharing that. What does withdrawal from fentanyl feel like? Uh, it's kind of like uh, anxiety. So it's like anxiety because you think you're you're gonna die, right? So it's like your body's your body's physical phys physical reaction to what's happening is you think that you're gonna die when you quit, right? So once you've been through withdrawal, it's kind of different because you know you're not gonna die, right? But it's uh, it's just like if you puke or whatever, you feel shitty. And then it, once it gets worse or whatever, you feel like you're going to die. So like all your bones hurt, your, your head hurts or whatever, right? But the anxiety, it depends on, depending on the person. Like if a person naturally has anxiety, um, like without doing drugs, and then they do fentanyl and they have withdrawals, their anxiety level is going to be way worse than a person who might say not have anxiety in the first place because that's going to affect a lot. So people that are more prone to having anxiety are going to have a lot harder time with that because they're going to think they're going to get withdrawals when they're not even getting withdrawals. You know what I mean? They're going to be a lot more anxious about it. So at this point, this sounds rough, like what you're describing. Um, what what was your decision there? Were you thinking, I want to get out of withdrawal? Maybe this is a point for me to take a turn and go to treatment, recovery, detox? Uh, at that point in time, when I lived in Abbotsford, there wasn't really like any, uh, I never really been exposed to recovery. I didn't even know what NA was or AA. 
So I didn't even know that those kind of things existed. And there wasn't really like um, any programs for methadone or suboxone or suboxone wasn't even invented then, I don't think, right? So it was like, there was no real, like in our minds, any way to quit, right? So we, we, we didn't know there was a way. When I found out there was a methadone clinic in Abbotsford, I think I tried that one time. Or no, I tried that a couple times, but that was with methadone clinic. That was a privately run one, though, right? So you had to pay for your your clinic fees, and then you had to pay for your methadone and everything like that, right? So it was like expensive. It was more expensive to quit doing drugs than it was to continue doing them. So it was kind of it was kind of silly in the first place, right? And then also like when we would go to get our methadone, it was like they would be like, "Oh, you're still using drugs. You can't get methadone." Like, well, that's kind of like silly right they, they piss us you'd be like oh you're still doing drugs you can't get methadone right it seems contradictory yeah and that was like they'd only give you like 20 or 30 mils to start with and then it was like the whole daily carry thing wasn't available you had to go to the pharmacy every day and that was in their pain in the ass and then because you're getting your prescription every day you got to pay your dispensing fee every day so that's like another 20 dollars on popular medication right so it was expensive to quit doing drugs that's interesting that it was expensive to quit yeah um um Okay, so things have changed a lot now. Things have changed a lot now. Like now, it's automatic. Yeah. They automatically pay for most people's medications. You don't have to pay for clinic fees anymore, right? But things like that have changed. But yeah. I remember back then it was like twenty bucks would make me feel better, but it was like it was thirty dollars to get methadone. And methadone wouldn't even make me feel better, so I still have to get pay thirty dollars for methadone and then spend twenty dollars on heroin. I still wouldn't feel better anyway. So, right. Um, okay. Can you describe the transition from Abbotsford? to the downtown east side what was it about the downtown east side that what was that transition like and, and what is the reason you ended up in the in the downtown east side the first place i moved out of abbotsford was was i moved from abbotsford to surrey because i was in jail and i seen that there's absolute chaos in surrey on the news when i was in jail so i was like oh that looks like a place that i would just fit right in right so i moved to surrey when i got out of jail one time and um, i've been in jail a few times by then right but i moved to surrey just because i thought i got uh i'd stick out less like a sore thumb in Surrey, I guess, if that makes sense. So it just kind of like blended the environment a lot better. So I moved to Surrey and there was more drugs around. There was more people around and that kind of lifestyle, right? There was like a bunch of homeless people in Surrey. So I moved to Surrey and um, I stayed in Surrey for a while. And then they cleaned up Surrey and they totally gentrified that whole Surrey central neighborhood a few years ago. So then I moved to Vancouver after that happened, once they kicked everyone out of Surrey. And, and what was it about the downtown east side that for Lack just to, just again, it made, everything was easier in Vancouver, right? So it was just, it was just like ease of my life, what was available, what I needed, right? So it was just like my my needs and my wants, you know what I mean? So it was easier to live. It was easier to live around other people that were doing similar things, where drugs were cheaper and more available than it was to live um, in Abbotsford, where drugs were expensive and not so available. When you say easier, what do you mean? Um, so like when I lived in Abbotsford, like drugs were probably like 10 times as expensive and 10 times harder to get than there in Vancouver. So once I moved to Surrey, it was a lot cheaper and a lot easier to get them. And then there were so many people doing things to make money to get drugs. that It was just easier to make money in Surrey living that life. And then same thing with Vancouver, it just made it even easier. What was it about Vancouver that made making money easier? um just in vancouver there's a lot of people shoplifting for example or selling drugs or doing drugs in public and all the things that there's just not enough cops to arrest everyone right so you're not you're not very likely to get arrested in vancouver for doing something stupid to make a little bit of money compared to if you live in abbotsford if you live in abbotsford they're gonna throw the book at you right so that's why i moved to vancouver so it was just, it was just made it easier to make a little bit of money to get a little bit of drugs plus when you spend 100 bucks in vancouver you're getting like what would cost you a thousand dollars in abbotsford right so it's not like and it's just everywhere. And there's people doing drugs in public and shoplifting all over the place and the cops aren't really gonna arrest you for it. So that was part of it too. So how much money per day are you spending at this point? A um, couple hundred bucks at least. Some more, some, some, depends on the point in my life, right? Cause at some points in my life I was doing really well. I was selling drugs, I had my own place to live and I was making a lot of money. So maybe I spent like 500 bucks a day. But I had between me and my girlfriend, maybe spending a thousand bucks a day. Sometimes in my life, I wasn't doing as well, and I was actually literally homeless. So I'd maybe only spend a hundred, couple hundred dollars in a day, right? That's 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 still a lot of money. Yeah, especially if you don't have a job. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um. Okay. So, how did things? Well, let, let's talk about access to treatment because now you're in the downtown east side. Um. What was that like? <laughs> Was the my option first, my first experience, my first experience with treatment was before I moved to Vancouver. It was when I lived in Abbotsford. I went to um, 
I got arrested one time. I went to treatment for a little while. I uh, was in Together We Can um, in Vancouver. But I didn't live in Vancouver at that point. I just went to treatment when I go to jail, right? So I lived in Abbotsford. I got in trouble. I got bailed to a treatment center. Whatever. That was my first experience in treatment, right? So that was my first kind of like uh, experience with NA and AA and everything like that, right? Right, right. Got you. Um, I see. Go ahead. I'm curious. You went to treatment, and then when you got out of treatment, were you able to, you know, stay away from substances? If you're still well, I was, I was, I was forced to go to treatment, like by the law. So I had to go there, and I, and I just like the whole hanging over my head, not wanting to go back to jail thing that kept me clean for about a year. But the day that I moved out of treatment, though, I used again once I was allowed to. Once, so once I was allowed to move out of treatment, right? Like I spent like a year in there between first stage and second stage treatment. I spent about a year in that treatment center. I was still on probation, so I had to stay there. And then once my probation officer let me move out of there, then I, I used again the first day I moved out of there. I wanted to do the whole time, right? But it was just it was it was keeping me from doing it, from not wanting to go back to jail. So the whole the whole stick, this carrot and the stick, right? So the stick was working at that point in time. It wasn't so much the carrot. Interesting. So for whatever reason, at that point in your life, that well, quote unquote stick was what was preventing you the relapse, I guess. Is, is that how you're, how you're describing it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and at different points in my life since then, I've maybe like wanted to get clean or whatever. But at that point in my life, I didn't really want to get clean. Because I didn't really have any, because most of my, most of my life I'd spent using drugs at that point. I was like 19 years old at that point. So most of my life I'd spent using drugs. So I didn't really like see it as a, an option to quit. Even though I did quit and I was in treatment, I didn't really like see it as something I wanted to do. Um, and what what types of medications did you try to uh, when it came to treating addiction? Uh, I tried um, methadone. I think at that point I was always on methadone. Um, yeah, I hadn't done Spox at that point. I was always methadone. It was always methadone. Okay. Okay. Um, was were prescription opiates at all in the picture at this point? You mean methadone and stuff like that, or you mean oh, other like pills? like oxycodone? No, other... that, that that's all. That, that was all way back in the day. I haven't seen any of that in a long time. Yeah. Okay. Except for now, a safe supply is kind of different, right? But okay, well, tell me about that. Uh, well, like the last few years, or whatever I've had experiences with like safe supply, like the hydromorphone and KDN or methadone and Dilaudid or things like that. So um, I guess I went to St. Paul's or whatever, uh, St. Paul's Rack Clinic a while ago. And at first I did methadone a couple of times there. I did Suboxone, but I always failed um, like staying clean with those things. So then they offered me to try it. That was when I first started doing that whole uh, Cadian and Dilaudid um, prescription. I was one of like, that was like when they first started offering it. And they said, well, why don't you try this instead? Because once they have tried everything else and they give you that, option right so but you've got to try other things and fail before they'll go there with you. they're not going to like take a person who's never been on suboxone or never been on methadone and offer them that but they look through my um uh, my uh pharmanet uh record and they said oh you've done these things like you've tried methadone you tried it 15 different times you tried suboxone 10 different times let's try something different so then they gave me Dilaudid and Cadian or whatever and then that was my first experience with safe supply which it, it helped when i was trying to get clean but it didn't really help when i wasn't trying to get clean it was more so like a choice at that point right yeah. so if i wanted to use i still would and it wouldn't stop me from being high or whatever but um but yeah that was my first experience with that okay, so, so you, you had experience with the with i guess it was be hydromorphone then yeah it was well it was dilaudid whatever that is whatever <laughs> that chemical name that is yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. And well, let's delve into that a little bit, uh, but I don't want, want to spend too much time on it because I want to get into sort of how you have sort of ended up back home and doing well. Um, but do you see any parallels between the oxycodone that you were using and then the hydromorphone that's not being used? Uh, well, yeah. You mean like people diverting their medication? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, like, well, like, so, like, when I first started taking Cadian and Dilaudid, like, I wasn't homeless at that point in time. Like, actually, I was just trying to clean, right? So I was just taking medication, right? But then when I wound up homeless or whatever, then everyone was just diverting their medication or whatever to other people to sell it, right? So most people that I know, in my experience or whatever, that have had prescriptions for Cadian and Dilaudid or whatever, they'll take their Cadian, but they'll sell their Dilaudid to get fentanyl or whatever, right? So obviously someone else is selling them to someone to, that's going to sell them to 
the younger people or whatever, right? So I guess the parallel between that was when I started doing oxycotton, I was taking oxycotton that was diverted from someone else, obviously, because they weren't taking it like they were prescribed to, otherwise they wouldn't be buying it, right? So that would be kind of the parallel between that and the Dilaudid or whatever, right? Because a lot of people divert their medication. So there's other people out there that are in rural towns back east or in rural BC or whatever that there's no fentanyl, but there is Dilaudid for sale or whatever, right? So that's what people wind up starting their addiction, I guess, if that makes sense. So, okay. Um, let's fast forward. And uh, just for the interest of time, I, I do want to allow some time for questions. Um, let's fast forward to, okay, well, you ended up, when we first met, um, you were in the emergency department at VGH, yep. and you'd come in with an overdose. Yeah. And so describe a little bit about what happened and how maybe this, this experience was, was maybe the turning point. Yeah, so like I hadn't used in a while, I hadn't used fentanyl in a while or any opiates or anything like that, right? So that day that you see me or whatever was like the first time that I'd used again in a while, right? So I relapsed or whatever, but like when you do, obviously if you're clean or whatever and you do something powerful like fentanyl and uh, obviously you're a lot more likely to relapse than you say if you're using it all the time or whatever, you're already using opiates, right? So, but I had a stable place to live or whatever, so that was part of it too, right? So I, I had some, like my mom was helping me out. I had a place to live at my mom's house, so that helped me. Like, because you gave me a prescription, I had a place to go after, right? Um, so we started you on the injection form of um, buprenorphine? Yes, Suboxone, yeah. Suboxone, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but the, the depot, so the trade name would be Sublocade. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think what we, I want to highlight one point, which I think is interesting, because there's, there are different ways of starting people on to Duplicate or the depot or the injection form of suboxone buprenorphine. Um, the standard way it really takes seven days. You have to be on the tablet for seven days before you can get the injection, right? Um, but what we did something different with you. We did a new protocol where we sort of on day one we gave you the injection. Right? Yeah. And, yep. and can you describe how it may have been different if you had to wait the seven days to get the injection? Uh, it would have been harder or whatever. I understand the point of this is to avoid having like precipitate withdrawals, which I have had happen before when I took Suboxone too soon. Yeah, right? yeah. But by that, that point when you see me, I wasn't using it every day, so I didn't have a bunch yeah. of fentanyl in my system. It was just that one time I used it. So it made it easier for me to start it, I guess. And Suboxone too, when I take Suboxone, I have highs and lows throughout the day, right? So it's like you take it and then you, you wind up like having a high like in the morning or whatever. You don't feel necessarily, you don't feel intoxicated, but you might have a... A really strong effect of medication in the beginning but then throughout the day you'll you'll have a low and then you'll have like a, a bad mood or whatever right so the difference is, i guess would be which made it easier for me to start it because it stays in your body consistently throughout the time or whatever yeah yeah no i got you um okay so we you got it's, it's, it's hard to go to the pharmacy every day too right like even if you have a stable living situation and you're well, you want to get clean it's still hard to go to the pharmacy every day it's like you know what i mean you got to go to the pharmacy if you're working you gotta go there before work in the morning or whatever it's hard to get up earlier in the morning to go there and then you gotta get a prescription from the doctor so you take off time off work to go to the doctor or whatever and it's not like it's not like the doctors are usually open on the weekend but some of them some of them are like that's why i used to go to st paul's all the time because they were open seven days a week right so and not not needing an appointment to go there was a big deal too right like you just show up whenever you needed your prescription and they would give you a prescription so i mean the yeah. spot that, that made st paul's really helpful but so it sounds like maybe the turning point was getting the injection because now you don't have to go to the pharmacy every day. You yeah. don't have to go see your doctor very, that frequently. Yeah. Um, and th there was one other key factor about sort of your path to sort of recovery that was super important. That was your mom. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Having a, having a supportive family or whatever, right? And like having a place to stay is helpful. So. It's, it's more, like for most people, it's almost impossible to like, you know what I mean? Get out of the situation they're in because they don't have support from their family or whatever. A lot of people's families just stop talking to them or whatever, or, or shun them or whatever, which is really helping your kid. Or, or if they say they caught their kid doing drugs or whatever, they might give them a hard time, right? It's not really going to help your, it's not going to help the person to give them a hard time about it. Yeah. You know, I think, I think that's a really important that you're highlight, important point you're highlighting because just looking behind you where you are right now um, you're at home you have a beautiful view behind you yeah um 
what's heartbreaking for us as as providers is, you know, we can be very good and sophisticated at getting people out of withdrawal and onto whatever treatment in the hospital, but that's only like a small part of the treatment because we oftentimes will just discharge them right back to the circumstance that was perpetuating their use. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and many of my patients, and like you, you painted this picture well, in that many of my patients described um, they may not have anybody they see on a daily basis or any attachments that don't use phantom. Yes. All of their relationships revolve around phantom use. In their environment, immediately when they wake up, they encounter a fentanyl. So it's omnipresent in their environment as well, right? Um, it becomes very difficult, I can imagine, to not relapse if you go right back to that circumstance. You know, sometimes I describe it as um, treating somebody for a gambling addiction in a facility and then throwing them right back into a casino. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you had that, I think, critical um, component that your mom was there for you and you went back home. Um, but then you also had access to care. You were able to come see us when you needed to see us for your for your. Yeah. Um, How does um yeah. it look staying abstinent right now, staying away from substances? Because I like the depot injection is great, but that journey is arduous, right? How does that work for you, Ross? Yeah, I guess you gotta like make a new group of friends, which is hard to do. It takes time, right? So you kind of pretty much like most people that you do use, they're everyone they know is gonna be using right regardless of uh whatever the living situation is right so you kind of like, gotta like you know i mean decide what you want to do with your life so i'm trying to figure out what i want to do as a career right now or whatever and like trying to like you know what i mean it takes time right so like you I don't know it's hard but how does it look though i guess i just try and take it easy though one day at a time yeah i don't count days i never found that counting days of clean time was very helpful because every time you relapse it's like you're it's like you're kind of giving yourself a hard time about it, right? Because like relapse is part of recovery too, right? So if someone yeah. if someone quits doing drugs six days out of the week and they only do them one day a week, they're still clean six out of seven days, right? So why would you constantly give yourself a hard time? Like, oh, I relapsed. I've only got one day clean now. You know what I mean? I just never really found that part of recovery made sense to me because it's like, you know what I mean? You get chips and then they take them away from you. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you don't have clean time or whatever. Like, oh, you got to have a year clean or whatever. You know what I mean? Things like that. It's just like, as long as you're doing less drugs, you're making progress. It's kind of like, you know, you should just be happy with yourself at that point in time, right? Got it. Because yeah. relapse is part of recovery. So, I mean, less the le less that you like, uh, like self esteem is a huge problem for a lot of people. Like, I don't have a problem with public speaking or self esteem. It's like some people do, right? So, I'm not very mm -hmm. like insecure, I guess, compared to most people. But almost everyone that I've met that does drugs, most of their problems are with their self image. So, with their parents, like giving them, saying, oh, you're a failure because you do drugs or, society looking at them saying they're a failure or judging them or whatever like that right yeah. so the least the least the judgment that people can impose on someone who's having a problem with drugs uh look at it more of like a health issue rather than like a, a, a behavior issue then it helps people a lot right yeah i think it's so important to reframe it like that and like extend grace to yourself right i think that's what you're getting at yeah um, and as healthcare providers i think that's really important to hear that that's what we also need to do. And we need to be more mindful of how we're kind of approaching abstinence and recovery and, and relapse. So yeah. thanks for sharing that piece as well. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, you know, thank you. Um, I'm mindful of the time. So I might say we can sort of stop there and, and sort of address any questions, but um, there's been a number of comments and many of them are just are, are commenting on your courage. You know, the fact that you, you've come, you know, you've talked about some of the most painful experiences of your life. Um, yeah, yeah. An audience you don't know, like that's asking a lot. So thank you so much. Yeah, no, um, you're welcome. So, I mean, if I can give like a little bit of insight and it helps one person, it's worth it, right? So, you know what I mean? Because like, the, the chances of people dying are so high, right? So even if it can help one person, even if it doesn't save a person's life, it can help them live a week longer, then it's worth it. You know what I mean? And also saving lives isn't the only goal too. Quality of life's a big thing too, right? So you know what I mean? Um okay. So I think if, if I'm correct, we have about 10 minutes. Um so um I don't know, Tam, if you want to moderate um any questions. Maybe take a few minutes of questions and move on. Awesome. Thank you so much again, uh Ross, for sharing your experience and of course. Puya and Jess for moderating the, the conversation. Um, 
So we do have a few comments here, and I wonder if you want to um, just add to that or just, just to respond. Um, yeah, I sure. Can I can read them out. Yeah. yeah, you can read them out. Sure, go ahead. For sure. Uh, first comment was from Simon here. Um, perfect example of what we will be seeing or already are seeing with the rampant diversion that we are seeing in BC. I imagine in five to 10 years, we'll be comparing the Oxy experience to the safe supply mistake. Um, would you like to add anything to that or? Yeah, I'd say that like 95, like I've, I've honestly never seen anyone who's been prescribed a lot and taken a lot, that's the truth. And like to get more specific about it, there's a lot of pharmacies that they make a lot of money off of people getting their medication from them, right? So they're, they're taking people and driving them to St. Paul's or wherever and giving them one pill, like one Dilaudid, so that when they take the piss test, they pass the piss test. So people that are, they're taking the piss test as the gold standard for making sure that someone's not diverting their medication. But I've never seen anyone, myself, take the medication as prescribed, if that makes sense. So I'd say that like 95 or 99% of Dilaudid is diverted. So I don't know, in most places that I know of, for sure that winds up is places like uh, smaller towns in Newfoundland or New Brunswick, uh, Labrador, uh, northern BC, northern Alberta, where the medication, it would be diverted and then sold for, say, 20 or 30 or 40 dollars a pill. And it's only worth a dollar or two in pill in Vancouver. So people are making a lot of money off it. And the reason they're doing that is because if they sell fentanyl in these small towns, the first person that overdoses, they're going to know, obviously, there's fentanyl in the town and the cops are going to go chase down a drug dealer and arrest them. So whereas Dilaudid, not very, not very likely you're going to overdose if you take a Dilaudid, right? So that's why I know for sure that people are doing that. So, so yeah, and comparing it to the Oxycon mistake, I guess it makes sense. I didn't really think of that, about that before, but uh, yeah, it definitely probably is pretty parallel. All right, so we actually have a lot more uh, questions coming in right now, Ross. Yeah. Um, so of course, like as uh, Dr. Zara already mentioned, there are a lot of very, very encouraging messages that, that sent um, to you. Um, then one person mentioned here that they really appreciate you sharing your, your story. It takes a lot of courage growing up at the same time or era. area. I appreciate that you highlighted the lack of education about substances at that time. It was just abstinence, don't do drugs, rather than providing the education about what substances are and the impact they have and their routes um, to access services. That's their comment. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, moving on to a few more questions here. Uh, what made you decide to stop substances? Can you remember a turning point? Um, a turning point, not necessarily, it wasn't like an aha moment, I guess, but like over time, obviously there's negative things that come with using drugs, like going to jail or, or negative things that happen to me, obviously, right? So, I mean, it takes time, but um, addicts are pretty hard-headed. They're not going to really like, you know what I mean? They're not going to be like, oh, this is bad for me. I better quit now, right? <laughs> they're not going to, they're not going to realize the very first time that it's a bad thing for them. It probably took me 10 years to realize that I want to quit, right? So it takes a long time for people to realize they actually want to quit. So you kind of have people keep people alive until they get to that point, right? So everything that was uh, out there, like naloxone, for example, saved my life multiple times. You know what I mean? Treatment centers helped me. You know what I mean? So it takes a lot. It takes a long time for the person, the patient to actually realize they want to get clean. So I wouldn't really um, say it was an aha moment, but it takes time. And um, you kind of got to see the value in being clean in order to want to be clean. I guess that makes sense, especially if you're dealing with trauma or whatever. I wasn't so much myself, but yeah. All right, so the next question we have is, what is the discussion about supplicate with your peers, Ross? Um, are they positive? Uh, my peers, so like no one else, um, I guess positive, yeah, but like I don't really have too many friends or whatever that I talk to about it or whatever, but um, I find that supplicate's easier to take because you're obviously you don't have to go there every day. You, know, you only gotta go between every two weeks or once a month to go to an appointment, so it makes it a lot easier, especially if you have a life, right? So. Uh, most of the prescriptions that they give people, they want them to go every day to the pharmacy, which is almost impossible for most people to do, especially because, you know what I mean, if you're, especially if you're still in addiction or whatever, or whatever you don't know when you're going to be able to go there. Um, yeah, but I, I find it positive myself, though. I find it a lot easier for myself because I don't have mood swings anymore. I don't have highs and lows um, taking it, so I don't feel any highs and lows. It makes it a lot more easier for me. Okay. And, and Tam, I'm just looking at, at the time. We're sort of getting towards the hour mark. Um, I'm wondering if we should maybe leave it there. And Yeah, perfect.
for sure. Um, so we can just uh, record all the questions here, or you can also maybe, um, I don't know if Ross or uh, Dr. Azar or Jeff, if you're comfortable with maybe sharing your contact and, and so, somehow for the uh, audience to maybe ask more questions. Um, Cause it seems like people are very interested in what you got to say, especially Ross here. I think there is one question that we should just touch on and it's how did your mom approach things that made it safe for you to rely on her for support? I think that's really important. Um, I think that um, not like viewing it in a negative light, I guess, like, you know what I mean? The less uh, ostracizing that you can do for uh, from a parent to whoever, because it's hard to, it's hard for a parent to like decide that they're going to have to like accept that overdose is a prior recovery or uh, addiction is a prior, or sorry, relapse is a prior recovery. So I think that the more like, um, neutral that the parent can be, I guess, because they didn't grow up with drugs in their lifetime like we grew up with drugs in our lifetime. So with uh, like the societal part of it's a big deal, right? So I guess just being nice to your kids is a big deal. Uh, the more that you can do to educate someone's parent to make them understand it's not a behavioral issue, then better it is for the kid, right? Because if you, if you view it in the frame of if you want your kid to succeed, then you're going to have to be nice to them regardless of whatever they do. And you know what I mean? That's pretty hard for a parent to do, but I think that was what my mom did, I guess, if that makes sense. She didn't really take it personally. It wasn't she didn't view it as her failure or my failure for what I was doing. So the more that you can frame it that kind of light, the more likely that you are to have someone succeed. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, a um, little, little of what I know about your mom is, uh, you know, she she's, she's pretty um, no nonsense. So she calls you on your stuff. But at the same time, she's like, it appears extremely kind and loving and accepting of you. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that interesting balance which she has where, um, you know, like if things aren't working, they're not working, she'll call you on it. But at the same time, when things are working, you're back home, you're welcome. Yeah. Somebody's writing firm but fair. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Fun. Just to, oh, again, so just to be mindful of time, thanks again, everyone, for joining this session. Um, and of course, big thanks to Ross, Dr. Azar, and of course, um, Jessica as well. Um, and uh, for our attendees, uh, before I wrap up, I want to invite everyone to join us in the closing panel, which will start at 3.20. Um, so just right now. So let's head over there. So thanks again. Thanks for your time, everyone. Have a nice day. Hi. Bye.